Lieve mensen, ladies and gentlemen, welkom. Also, on behalf of Meridian Uitgevers and Java Bookshop, one of the nicest bookshops in Amsterdam, to this afternoon of literature and film at the Amsterdam Public Library. My name is Gavi Keizer. Now, before we uh, continue, um, we have just seen a film in this uh, beautiful theater. So you might or might not know that film is part of the programming at the Amsterdam Public Library. Um, in October, there will be an Amsterdam Film Festival. Uh, sorry, uh, Amsterdam Spanish Film Festival. The Spanish Film Festival will be in October. And we also have a program at the library called Cinema Literaire. And that is a series of monthly um, evenings where we show a film based on a uh, work of literature. And in the coming months, you will be able to see such diverse titles as uh, uh, Agora by Alejandro Amenabar, The Hunt for Red October by John McTiernan, Oblomov, based on the novel of Ivan Konjarov, and in December we will be screening Dr. Zhivago by David Lean. So the take the folder with you, all the dates and particulars are there. All right, before I it takes too long, I want to tell you something. For the past week, I have been immersed in almost 2,000 pages of paper. In these 2,000 pages, I experienced love, death, happiness, sadness, violence, tenderness, incredible beauty, incredible intensity. Like we say in the Netherlands, in those two weeks, ik had geen leven. That means, I had no life. It's a saying in the Netherlands, Guillermo. And yet, while reading this, I had all the life you could ever need. Because this is what literature like this can do. It gives you air to breathe, gives you spaces to live in, so, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce to you the man who created these spaces for me and for millions of other readers. Ladies and gentlemen, Guillermo Arriaga. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. So yes, Guillermo, that means ik had geen leven, it means you have no life. But actually it's a very nice thing because I was busy reading your book, so <laughs> I, had, I had all the life I could ever need. Guillermo, welcome, and also welcome to the Netherlands. Um, so I have to ask you, how do you find our country? <laughs> this is rainy. <laughs> <laughs> no, this but is wet, my, isn't it? This is my 12th time to Holland. Ah. Uh, I've been I've been touring around uh, for the past uh, days, and uh, I've become an expert in Flissingen. I went back and forth a lot of times, but I, I, I uh, thanks to Meridian, I I've been traveling through the country promoting the book, which is a, a privilege for me. With the the Ottenbari, how you say it in in Dutch, the Ottenbari. I went to Breda, I went to La Haga, I went to Rotterdam, and other, other cities, Utrecht, and of course Amsterdam. We've got an interesting country, because a couple of years ago you became almost a household name uh, in our country when your novel, The Untamable, the, the, in Dutch, The Ontembare, was book of the month on a TV show called De Wereld Draait Door. Now, in English, that, that, the, the title of the show means the world goes crazy. It's a crazy show, but that, anyway. Now, for me, that was in itself a crazy thing, that your book, The Untamable, became Book of the Month, because it's a massive novel. Um, here it is, The Untamable. It's a massive novel. Uh, it's bursting out of its seams with... Um, now all the things I mentioned just now, with with yeah, with with violence and sex and and madness and passion, but 
it became so popular in a country that holds normality and saneness and moderation in almost religious regard. So, th for me, that was an interesting question, how this novel can be so popular in this country. Do you think that your novel, especially that one, um, satisfy kind of needs in readers to transgress boundaries, to go into I think that the unknown? Most people need at least to have a, a peep on the abysses on the extremes. Uh, we live, sometimes we live very orderly lives. And uh, there's a, a group of novels, a trend of novels that uh, my, my publisher, uh, Neleke, says, is, it's called, they, they call it in, in Canada the domestic novels. Uh -huh. But there's also these, these kind of, of stories which I write where people can, can go to the extremes and can see something they had never experienced. And I think that's part of, uh, of literature. Also shows ways where we can be, be someone else and to behave like someone else. And, uh, and I think that was the purpose of, for example, Shakespeare, when he was writing all these Hamlet and Macbeth, this very extreme um, things. I think it was part of the novels of the ten, uh, 19th century. Stendhal, uh, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, they always have these extremes, people going to the extremes. So I think it's also important for, um, for a reader to know that there are other ways of living. And I think that's what my novel can show. Uh, that's an interesting point, because we have just seen the film um, uh, Babel by Inaritu. The film came out in 2006, and that, that film also does what you just described. It shows people from diverse backgrounds whose lives are somehow interconnected with each other. So we're almost watching the movie learn to, to, to stand in their shoes, and they also learn to stand in each other's shoes. Um, it, I think that's what you meant when you just just said that these, these characters learn to be like, learn to, th to, to 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 not to live like each other, but to understand, to have empathy. No, and you know something. All society, all country, can go to the extreme in the matter of days. When my book was just published in Ukraine. And I was having the first reviews in Ukraine when suddenly everything changed. Yeah. And it, I was very saddened that the, the, the Ukrainian publishing house says, we will not longer be able to deliver your royalties because we have to close. Uh, yeah. And I have friends that travel to Ukraine to go to Chernobyl to have this tour. And everything changed in a matter of days. I... I, I um, there was in the news in Mexico, Mexicans saying, ah, that thing of the war is just bullshit. Nothing's going to happen. That's uh, an exaggeration by the media. Yeah. When will, I, I have um, a friend whose uh, parents, uh, uh, her, whose, whose grandparents were Jewish in Germany, and they say, okay, we're doing business with the Nazis. Nothing is going to happen. And they, 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 they were killed in, in Auschwitz. Yeah. So we know the United States that looks like the ultimate normal country. Well, not, not really anymore. <laughs> the, 6th of, the 6th of January of last year, it almost become an extreme country. Is that also what you meant when you say it can change like this? It can change like this. Yeah. And with, with any one of us, things can change very quickly. Yeah. So I think that a book a novel that can show that there's extreme life can also show that there's this possibility always. Not, no matter how normal and orderly you, 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 you have your life or your society organized. Do you think that, um, just speaking broadly, that that is something that, that we in Western Europe are just now discovering, 
that it's not as safe here as we thought it was. And the war in Ukraine might, might just be the first sign that things are going to change very quickly. Or maybe they have already changed. The moment, for example, that the United, if, if uh, the, sorry, Russia uses a nuclear weapon in Ukraine, everything's going to change in Europe in 24 hours yeah. or less. Yeah. Because the United States is going gonna, is gonna to bomb yeah. Russia, yeah. Yeah, like that. And suddenly you can, we can be in a nuclear war without even knowing it. You know, the funny thing is, uh, about two months ago, having this discussion, we would have made a joke about it. I could have joked about what you just said. I can't do that anymore <laughs> because it's dead, deadly seriousness. Yeah, so, so fortunately in my life, a, a lot of things had happened to me. And uh, I, I'm able to tell these, these stories from yeah. immediate personal experience. Yeah. And, uh, and, I think that, and I think that's what my novel can bring to, to, to yeah. readers. Could we just go back to your own roots? Because I'm really interested in that. You were born in 1958 in Mexico City. Now, I'm really curious about your memories of the city. How it was then and how it is now. Is there a big difference, how, how it was then and how Yeah, it's a big difference. Um, it was manageable city. It was like 11 million. Now we are like 24 million. And the population. So it was, even though it was a gigantic city, it was manageable. And uh, I used, when I was a kid, I used to go to school or to see friends whatever on, on the public uh, transportation. I don't know if I would send my kids, now my, my kids are grown-ups, but, but I will not send them by public transportation. It becomes a little bit more risky. And um, where I grew up, it was a very um, particular place. It's called Unidad Modelo. I always wear my shirt with Unidad Modelo, but I have been using all, all of it, so I have to wash it. <laughs> but I have Unidad Modelo, which means the model neighborhood. Yeah. And it was created in order to have the sense of a small town in the middle of the city. All the services were there. There was the, um, the supermarket, the church, the schools, the, the playing grounds. The, the sporting, uh, there were baskets and, 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 and tennis courts and everything. Everything was there so we can feel we were living in a little town, which is really, I, I really um, have this sensation that I grew up in a town yeah. where I met, I knew everyone and we were playing on the streets and, and everything. And, uh, but not, not everyone in Mexico City can can be in the streets, can, can play in the streets like, like I played when I was a kid. Because it's too dangerous, because of the... No, no, it's because the configuration of the, of, ah. of, of the place. Yeah. No, it's not, it, Mexico City is not, is right now, yeah. it's not that dangerous, I can tell you. Uh -huh. My kids, my son was never robbed in Mexico City. The moment he went to, to live in Canada, he was robbed the first <laughs> week. And then he went to live to Paris where he was robbed six, <laughs> six times. And that had, had never happened to my son in, in Mexico City. So it happened in Paris. Yeah. I read somewhere that um, um, when you were 13, you were involved in a street fighting. Many street fights. So you have to tell me about that. How, what, what happened? Was it just for fun or was it seriousness? or? No, I don't think violence is made for fun. Ah. It's because the place I grew up, it was a very nice place to, to grow, but it was also violent. Mm -hmm. And I experienced uh, a lot of violence that I didn't ask for. At the age of 13, I was this size, a little bit taller. I was 188 at the age of 13, which in Mac I know that here I am, I am a dwarf. But in Mexico City, <laughs> in Mexico City, I was tall. Uh -huh. So big guys, 25, 28 years old, come to be the big guy. But the big guy was 13. <laughs> and um, I experienced more serious episodes of violence when I was, and, and I told this in, in some 
some place here in, in, in Holland. We were playing, I was 10 years old, we were playing uh, baseball. And uh, in the street, it, it was not even a wide street. It just rained, there were, there were a lot of holes in my, in, my, in my street, full of water, and there were the bases. Uh -huh. And suddenly a guy, 25, goes and slaps me in the face. I have no idea why he did that. So I, had the, I, was, I was batting, so I grabbed the bat and said, what's the problem with you? But he took the bat and hit me with the bat and almost killed me. Uh, he hit me badly. I was running from him. And the last blow was in my neck. And I couldn't move from the neck down for six hours. They, they, they thought I was paraplegic. It's, I don't know if you have that sensation that you cannot even move your hands, nothing. You're just like... And uh, I have no idea why he, he beat me so badly. Um, that, it seems to me that that must have influenced you um, growing up, the, the, the violence. Of course. And also um, your writing that returns. That's a common theme. I want to talk about short, uh, very briefly about The Untamable, um, and then move on to your, to, to your new book, because um, The Untamable is a really fascinating read. It's been described, and I wonder what you think about this, um, Goodfellas meets White Fang. <laughs> um, so it, it kind of describes what the story is. You've got yes. the gangsters in, New York, in, in Mexico City, and you've got the parallel story about the wolf and the hunt. So I, I, can, I can see that. But um, your, your pr protagonist, um, uh, Juan Guillermo, uh, has pledged violence, of, uh, vengeance for his murdered brother, Carlos. Um, then, we, then it goes on for his, for his parents, sentenced to death, almost, he feels, by their, by their grief. And then you've got the Catholic fanatics in the city who killed Carlos and were allied with the police chief, a corrupt, a corrupt um, police commander. And um, I'm just wondering, Guillermo's uh, quest for revenge. H why? Why does he go so fully into the into that, onto that path towards revenge. Is there really no possibility for him to not take revenge? It's because there's no justice in Mexico. Only 1% of the crimes are, are, are pursued by the justice, only 1%. Yeah. The rest of the 99%, nothing happens. And when you don't have justice and they kill your brother, what, what options do you have? But the book is not about revenge. The book is about finding something else. Mm -hmm. It's like moving on. You know, for many years I have the, the fantasy of going back to the man that hit me with the bat. Because I was a kid, I was 10 years old. Yeah. And a guy 25 hit you with a bat with no reason. I, I just realized why he beat me a month ago. Oh, t tell me. Because I say to my, to my brother, say, run, asshole. So because we were playing, he had to run from one base to the other. And the guy thought that I was telling his sister, asshole. <laughs> and he almost killed me. So it's a misunderstanding. By a misunderstanding. Almost killed me. Yeah. And I went to the prison three days ago here in Holland. And there was a guy who says, yeah, a guy also bat me. Like you, but I kill him. Mm -hmm. I, I, I look for him. When I was 15, he killed, he, he hit me, and I wait like for three years until I was able to kill him, and I kill him. So the book is not about revenge. The book is about, if you don't have justice and you, and revenge puts in the same level of the, of the bad guy and the same human quality, you should not. You should not be like him. Yeah. And I was telling. I was telling the prisoners this story, and telling them I didn't want to be prisoner of this guy, because revenge makes you a prisoner of the guy, or whoever you want to. Have. You take revenge, and um, it's not an easy decision not to take revenge. And in the Otimbari, 
on, on my book, El Salvaje, is there's an option, there's another option. And the other option is to move on. I, I seem to remember a passage in your book, The Untamable, where they talk about uh, revenge as a theme in, for instance, Hamlet. And one of the characters, I think it was, was um, uh, the main character, thinks by himself, um, I am not interested in Shakespeare's vision of, on, on violence. That, that doesn't tell me anything. What I'm interested in is what I feel inside. So is it is it also something like that the, the violence, something that comes from inside? It's not something to do with whether you can have justice or not. It's just part of human nature, the violence. Yeah, you know, I invented a book there, which is called uh, On Forgiveness by a Jewish author. The book doesn't exist. The Germans were crazy looking for the rights oh, yes, of yes. the book, and it doesn't exist, the book. It's invented on forgiveness. But it says, uh, because I admire very much how the Jewish people have decided this, mm -hmm. because what they did to them was horrible. One of the most horrible things, and I think that I had really admire the Jewish culture which doesn't mean that I admire the Jewish government. Yeah. I, admire, I admire the Jewish people. And uh, they, many of my Jewish friends have said, we have, as, as, a, as, as a group, we have to learn that justice is more important than revenge. Yeah. And that we need not to forgive, because sometimes that's an option, not to forgive but to move on, but to look for justice. Because they could easily went for the Nazis that were hiding in South America and killed them. But they brought them to justice. Brought them to justice, yeah. But what do you do in a third world country like mine where there's no justice? Yeah. That theme also returns in your new book, um, which I, I, I just have to sh shortly, because maybe not everybody has read it yet. Um, in Het uh, Vuur Redden, Saving the Fire, we meet uh, four characters, Marina, wealthy and happily married woman with three children, who's a choreographer and owns her own dance company. We meet uh, Jose, I can't, ex don't know how. Cuauhtémoc. Cuauhtémoc, Jose Cuauhtémoc, um, a very interesting man. He's imprisoned for killing his own father. Um, and the father was a distinguished indigenous um, uh, scholar. You have uh, Jose's brother, Francisco, and you have El Maquinas, uh, he's a hitman for a drugs cartel. Who, and, and Jose meets him in prison, because he goes to prison after the murder of, um, on his father. Um, but it's the affair between Marina and Jose that forms the main narrative line. And what an affair you have, you have described in this book. Because Jose is in prison, Marina comes to prison because her dance company performs there. And while he's in prison and she visits, they have this love affair. What? Uh, it, it seems doomed from the start. <laughs> yeah, but first of all, I must tell you that after I published the novel, I have uh, many women have same in Twitter or Instagram. Guillermo, can we have a Zoom? I want to tell you something personal. Yes, uh, I'm a married woman and I went to prison and now I have a, a love affair with a inmate <laughs> and there are seven of them so that happens more often you see, I, yeah it happens more often and, and even my publishers say well yeah, I don't think that exists when a publisher in France says I just divorced because I am in love with an inmate so it happens and not necessarily it's doom I, one of these women say that it's the perfect lover Wh why, why? Because it's, you, you, it will not make a scandal in, in, in a cafe. It will not go and, and, <laughs> and, and, and call your husband. It will not appear in your husband's <laughs> office. You decide when you see him. And he will not make any... any, any uh, they will not be public fights. Yeah. So they keep them there. And uh, I don't want to see him now. <laughs> and he ha can do nothing. He can't do anything. He cannot call you and say, you have to see me, or call to your house, yeah. because they don't have, uh, supposedly they don't have 
cell phones. But luckily, in the story that you did, that you that you d developed in this novel, it becomes complicated because Marina, um, this really classy lady, she has to choose. She, she has the choice to make between this uh, sedated life. She's she's married. She's got three children, and a life that she really d dreams of with Jose. She has to make this choice. And what I love about the story is that in the beginning, she thinks that she can do both things. I can keep on loving my husband, taking care of my children, and then I can go to the prison with Jose, being with Jose. So that's, that's how she goes <laughs> into this story, but obviously that won't work. Yeah, the original title of the novel was The, the Lion Behind the Glass. Ah, that's also nice. And, and there's a moment where she says, lions are beautiful behind the glass, but what happens when there's no glass yeah. and the lion's out? I will tell you briefly what the novel is about. I hope you will be interested in reading it. It's a very wealthy woman, three kids, married with a very wealthy man. She lives in, in this ideal world. Uh, and she's a choreographer, but she's a mediocre choreographer. She's like acknowledged by the critics, but nothing happens with her choreographies, uh, contemporary dance. And she goes and makes a, sh a show on the prison where she meets this guy, which is not a regular prisoner. He's the son of an indigenous activist and scholar, as you say, and he has been educated on the highest standards possible in, in Mexico. He speaks several languages. He knows philosophy, psychology, sociology, um, science. His father has been obsessed with education. But it's not only the story of, of this True, it's a story of, of how society can degrade, be degraded by, by violence and, and, and crime. And there's a lot of reflections on, about art. Yeah. Um, what I'm also very interested in was um, the symbolism in um, his father uh, being an activist for um, the original inhabitants of Mexico. Uh, his and his brother is also a successful businessman, but at the same time, is is a symbol of of neoliberalist liberalist ideology. They're very rich people, and they don't really care for the poor people. But how uh, w w was was that kind of s uh, a reflection of what's going on in the world today? This explosion of neoliberalism that we've seen the last couple of years, and it now turns out that it's not sustainable. Yeah, I uh, I think that there's. There's a division between um, the working class and the yeah. and the wealthy class, yeah. and I think that it's not possible that one percent of the population owns the fifty percent of the wealth. Yeah. So in Mexico, most of uh, the, the wealthy people have no knowledge of what's going on. Yeah. It's it's funny, but I have been in 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 um, book book clubs by Zoom, because it was a pandemic. And many of them were rich women that were saying, I have no idea that it was happening in Mexico. And uh, we have to acknowledge that it's a very classist uh, society, that it's a very racist society. Yeah. And we have to confront those, those things yeah. in order to solve them, because if we keep denying them... Yeah. So somewhere uh, in one of your books, the line comes, Mexico is not a sur surrealist country like you often hear. No, it's hyper-realist. Yes, it's funny, but this is the second time here in Holland that someone oh. tells me that line. Uh, yeah, Mexico, Mexico is hyper-realistic because everything, everything is goes to extremes. It's really intense with the, with the, the scenes that you're describing. It's, it's, it feels really real. So I think I've never been to Mexico City, but I think it... It, the, the image I have now of the city is a really intense city. It reminds me of Johannesburg, where I'm from originally. When I grew up in Johannesburg, it was an intense city. Uh, you walk down, around, uh, down the street and you, you, you see some things. <laughs> it's not yeah. like here where you, where you go into the Hema or whatever. Uh, <laughs> you see some other kind of things. So I that intensity also leads to another level of, of, of experience, human experience. It's, it's yeah, you can, you can be in Mexico, and, 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 and some parts of it can even look like as calm as Amsterdam. Uh, but no, it, it can be an intense city. Yeah. It depends where you move. 
It can be it can be the most calm city where nothing happens, full of cafes and restaurants. Yeah. We are now invaded by Americans. They discovered that they can work from their house <laughs> with a pandemic, and You're now they move. By Americans. No, no, they are, they really. They, there's flocks of Americans. You should just send them back. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. And they raise the, the rents now are very expensive in Mexico because the Americans, they are very welcome. But when they see a house, how much it is? Uh, $1,500. I'll give you 2000 <laughs> But give me that. Give me so it's a calm city, but it's also intense. Yeah. You know, Johannesburg, I think, it's this one of the five more dangerous cities in the yes. world. So it has to be intense. I'm interested in uh, that intensity, uh, that hyper-realist intensity. Is that what attracts Marina to Jose? Of course. I, I know there's Latin American people here. I know, I heard Spanish. I don't know if Mexicans or not. But they are Mexicans. Uh -huh. And in Mexico, bienvenidas, muchas gracias por venir. Uh, in Mexico and Latin America, for some, I don't know if it happens in Europe, but the idea of happiness for women is finding a stability, not passion. Is no matter if you're a su successful woman or not, you have to marry a man that will give you stability. Mm -hmm. Even though if you're a very successful businesswoman, you need stability. And, um, and men, they have to be like always the provider, you know, the, is this, this happiness. So many women in, in Latin America, they choose stability over other things. Yeah. And sometimes the stable men are so fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> they are extremely boring. You know, yeah. with no interest, they, they are just plain. And women who married this good guy when they were like 23, 24, 25, when they, they met, when they are like 45, it's like, really, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with this thing? <laughs> and that's what's happened to the character. I have to, we have a couple of minutes left, unfortunately. I have to ask you about um, the character of this Jose. We, you just touched upon it. Because he seems to me to be like um, an impossible figure uh, that's, that's like an alpha male who reads Shakespeare and a lot of other books as well. So it, I find that a really interesting image. And he also says at a certain point in time, um, you, ha you have to eat red meat. There's no eating grass. You can't be a vegetarian because that's not who I really am. He's talking about human nature, uh, human race. So that's a really interesting f um, image of, of masculinity that's not really in step with our times, I thought when I read the book. Well, he, he is the son of an indigenous activist that marries a white Spanish, the daughter of the Spaniards. So he has always been uh, discriminated because of being an Indian. And in Mexico, even there's an insult that it's Indio, Indian. I just have a car accident incident, and a guy says, Indio, Indio. It's what, like, at this time you're still with these insults? And people with Indian features in Mexico, they are, they are not commercials. There are no films about them. They are not soap operas about them. Uh, they can even be denied the entrance to the nightclubs because they look Indian. Mm -hmm. And this, this, the father says, Athens, Sparta. Yeah. You have to be the most educated people in the room and the strongest one. Yeah. You have to work out like crazy. You have to box. And you have to be an intellectual. And it's nothing about the alpha male. It's about a way of surviving racism. Ah, OK, that's a good point. OK, is in order to survive racism, yeah. you have to be the strongest and the most smart in yeah. a room, which instead of, of, of 
of um, having a smart and strong son, he has a sociopath. Yeah. Because he's <laughs> he breaks him. Yeah. And that's a tragedy that you have to be that. So th that leads to this tragedy. And, uh, you know, I, I am an advisor for the Aboriginals in Australia. I'm an advisor for the Maoris in New Zealand. And they share a lot of things in common. Yeah. You, you, you come from South Africa. Yeah. It's the same thing. We uh, really um, recognize the, the, the idea that you have to be, because you, not me, but uh, black people in South Africa are uh, victims of racism, they have to be stronger. That's what Mandela, when Mandela came free, he had to be the cleverest, he had to be the savior, he had to be... There's so many things asked of people who are victims. Yeah, um, the, the, so, so he's, not, he's, he, he's not that he wants to be the alpha male. No. It's the only way to survive yeah. a, 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 a society that tends to discriminate. Yeah. And uh, that's why he's educated in, 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 in such a way. Yeah. Lastly, um, uh, I also wanted to ask you about the, uh, the sex in, in your latest novel, because I found that really beautiful. It's very explicit, the sex scenes, but it's all about being intimate, a kind of intimacy. You are just telling the word that I love the most to describe erotism in my novel. This woman discovers not sexual pleasure, but sexual intimacy. Yeah, that's different. Which is very different from, because many, many, many people that read the book say it's gross. It's not gross, I think it's beautiful. Yeah. It's intimacy in its, in its most. Yeah. And I am tired of, of novelists hiding the sex scenes. Uh, it's, uh, really, it's like they kiss and flowers come. <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> and uh, why do, can we say things like he stick his dick in her ass? <laughs> like it is. Well, because Hollywood films creates this antiseptic kind of sex where you don't see anything. So th that's the image that we live by since the 1950s. I think we have to be explicit. I want to be explicit. And I am... Uh, and you know something? It has become like... A it's not an erotic novel. It's, it has by no means is an erotic novel. It's not Fifty Shades of Grey. God, thank, thank God, yeah, for that. But many women in Mexico had used the erotism to tell their husbands, read this. <laughs> 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 and it's funny, but in the, in the in the in the book clubs, I almost become like a, a, a sexual advisor, like. <laughs> <laughs> It's only it's on it's a it's a 900 page novel. It has only 25 pages of erotism, but people is like, okay, how can I ask my husband to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you're going to have the same effect in our country because I think we can need it as well. We we can use. I can it. I can no. I, I, come on, this is the country of Javier Aonander. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, and uh, Giacomo, Giacomo Casanova was also in Amsterdam from time to time. Yeah, and, 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 uh, and uh, you, you have famous, uh, very famous for being very liberal sexually. So I, I thought a Mexican can... This is also story. a very relig religious country still. Uh, and I, I'm just going to tell a, a fun story. When I was a kid, the porn films were made by, by Swiss, no, by, by Swedish uh, yeah. women and, and men, but they were dubbed by by Puerto Ricans. <laughs> and it was very funny because it was this Swedish saying, mami, dame, madre, so mamita, por favor. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Guillermo, we have to, we have to close this, uh, this discussion. I haven't even talked to you about movies, but maybe that's a good thing. But I would like to ask you, um, uh, you've written two really huge novels and uh, I have so enjoyed reading this. So are you still planning on writing this big, kind of big books? Yeah, because you know, size matters. <laughs> 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 no, no, I have just finished another book. I just submitted to my, uh, to my publishing house a week uh -huh. ago. Yes. It's gonna be published in February, they, they, they love it. Uh, it's not as big, it's not small. And uh, and I finished. I submitted a week ago, 
And three days ago, I began my new novel. I love to be pregnant. <laughs> and um, and I, I'm going back to cinema. I'm going back to directing. I love directing films. I am producing my kids' uh, film. They are shooting October 17, the long feature. Mariana and Santiago, they co-direct. And I wrote um, a screenplay called Open Up in Sky, which was the original, original story from the trilogy of Amores Perros and 21 ah. Times. It was, that was, that's the original trilogy. I was supposedly gonna direct, and uh, I was supposedly gonna direct the three of them. And um, now I sold the rights for many years, and I recover them, so they are shooting the, the, the really first part of the trilogy of Amores Perros and 21 Grams. So I'm producing that film, and I'll be directing next year. I guess it really doesn't matter if you direct films or write books, um, you, you tell the stories. And I think that's what we are addic addicted to, the, the stories that you have to tell. No, and I must say that I'm very uh, privileged. Here's Carla de Jong, my other publisher with Nele Kegil. I feel very honored to be and privileged to be published by Meridien. It's, uh, and uh, I know publishing a book from a Latin American author is not easy. It's not people in Holland are not very acquainted to Latin American. So it's a very courageous act to publish me and to take me around and to bring me to Holland. So I am uh, very grateful, Carla. And I hope that you will, read my book, let me say you something. I, I spent almost five years with, uh, writing my book, and someone say, I read it in uh, four days. Yes, that's And true. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> but someone, a wise, wise guy told me, put those four days from one reader with four days of other readers, and four days or not for other readers, and maybe you can have your five years. <laughs> As you have a deficit, please give me your four days, <laughs> if you are so kind. Uh, well, Guillermo, it has been a personal honor to meet you, and to, no, meet thank you, you, and to read your books. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Guillermo Ariaga. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.